You may have seen videos in which someone is using an old computer when it suddenly makes popping and crackling noises and smoke starts to pour out of it. This is caused by the reefer capacitors in the power supply, which have started to crack and fail with age, and eventually they short out and go up in smoke. Here we go, baby. Oh, yeah. Holy moly, I gotta turn that off. I didn't get it on camera, but that's what happened with my Zenith Z148 PC. And in this video, I'm going to repair it and get it working properly again. But first, a little bit of history. The Z148 was created in response to the IBM PC Junior. Zenith wanted to have a product which would compete with the PC Junior on a dollar basis, but would have an improved keyboard and full IBM PC compatibility. But unfortunately, someone else beat them to it. The Tandy 1000, which had an even lower price, better sound and graphics, was more expandable, and was sold at thousands of Radio Shack stores, while Zenith computers were available at a much smaller number of dealers. Nonetheless, the Z148 was released in 1985, and it was competitive in price to many PC clones. But notice the asterisk on this chart. It says, no expansion slots. The Z148 does have what looks like one ISA slot on the back, but you had to pay extra for an optional daughter board in order to actually use that slot. Zenith's excuse for not including any expansion slots was because it included everything the typical entry-level PC user needed built in. Parallel and serial ports, CGA graphics with RGB and composite video outputs, and up to 768K of RAM on the motherboard. Plus its 8088 CPU runs at 8 MHz, providing performance up to 60% faster than the IBM PC. And unlike the PC Junior, it came with a full-size keyboard with excellent typing feel. The Z148 was actually built for Zenith by the Heath Company, and it was sold as a Heath kit, which you assembled yourself, at a significant discount compared to buying a fully assembled one. That kit did not require any soldering, and one user said he was able to put it together in about an hour. So you may see some of these machines badged as a Heath HS148 instead of as a Zenith ZF148. And although it was not a success on the consumer market, the Z148 was popular with colleges and universities. In the mid-1980s, they had rooms full of dozens of them. But unfortunately, very few of those seem to have survived, because educational institutions usually have very strict rules not allowing employees to take home equipment that is no longer needed. So when those Z148s became obsolete, they just ended up in the dumpster. And that's why very few of these machines seem to still exist today. Because so few of these computers are left, I really want to get this one working again. So let's take a look at what went wrong and how we can repair it. <laughs> Unusually for a PC, both the top and bottom of the case are made of plastic, as are the screws which hold on the cover. Inside you'll be greeted with the power supply, the floppy drives, and the main circuitry. And here's the worst part of the whole machine. That screw down there holding in the power supply there's barely any room between the power supply and floppy drive frame to get in a screwdriver to remove it and it's almost impossible to reinstall. I think they meant for you to remove the floppy drive frame first before removing the power supply. That's why there's that little cutout there. But that screw isn't much easier to get to. Then you should be able to remove the power supply. But don't yank it out too far until you remove the PC speaker which fits into a rubber gasket in the front of it. Here is the power supply removed. The sticker on the top says EIA343, which means this was actually made by Zenith. I know they also made some of the power supplies that were used in the IBM PS2 machines. Although the fan in it was made by Panasonic. Well, here's the culprit. It blew the top right off this Rifa capacitor. There's two smaller ones here which also look like they were starting to crack. So those are probably also getting ready to blow open. And hiding in the back here is an even bigger one. You can just see it behind this transformer. 
It's kind of hard to read because it was split open right across it, but I think that says 0.22 microfarad, and down there it says X2, which indicates it's an across-the-line AC safety capacitor. So even when the computer is not in use, as long as it's plugged in, this capacitor is energized, and that's what causes it to fail first. And that's also why turning off the computer will not stop these from smoking out once they do fail. You have to unplug the power supply when that happens. These two smaller ones say 4700 picofarad, and they say Y, which indicates these are line to ground safety capacitors. And this big one in the back says 0.47 microfarad, but I'll need to desolder it to see what type it is because it's blocked by that transformer. And on the circuit board behind it, you can see the Zenith logo. So this power supply definitely was manufactured by Zenith. And I'm sure two things people are going to say is that it's dangerous to go poking around in a computer power supply. You could get shocked. And also that I should replace all these capacitors, not just these Rifa capacitors. Well, first of all, this hasn't been turned on in months. So any charge that remained on these capacitors has long since dissipated. So there's no shock hazard here. And also these capacitors are probably better quality than anything I could replace them with today. They show no signs of failure, no signs of leaking, so I'm going to leave them alone. And there they are, the refill capacitors all removed. This is the one that blew open and cracked its top. And... That one is the 0.22 microfarad X2 capacitor, rated at 275 volts. This one is 0.47 microfarad, also 275 volts, and that's also an X2 capacitor. And these two smaller ones are the Y capacitors, both 4700 picofarad, and they say 250 volts and 125 volts. So I guess that's nominal and that's peak voltage. And the power supply, and thus the computer, will still work fine with all these capacitors removed. It'll just be more prone to electrical noise coming in on the AC line. So if someone turns on the toaster and your computer crashes, then you'll know why. Also, without these capacitors installed, the computer itself will put out more electrical interference. Not good for anybody listening to AM radio nearby. The new capacitors are installed. They're all a bit smaller than the originals, and I don't expect them to last for 37 years like the Rifas did. Here I go plugging it in. And remember, some of these capacitors are energized as soon as you plug it in, even if the power supply is not turned on yet. So, at least no explosions yet. I have it connected to this old MFM hard drive as a test load. Let's see what happens. Well, that all sounds normal. Let's check the voltages. This should be 12 volts. 11.8, close enough. And this should be 5 volts. 5.07. So it's looking good. With the floppy drives removed, we can see the main circuitry of this computer. It's actually split onto two boards. There's the main CPU board and then the I.O. board. And most of these are just 74 LS series chips, so it's clearly not a highly integrated design. There's the 8088-2 microprocessor made under license from Intel by AMD and a socket for an optional 8087 math core processor. There's the ROM chip, copyright 1984 by Zenith. And there's the RAM. It has 256K installed, upgradable to 768K, only 640K of which is usable by DOS. And luckily these are not the failure-prone MT RAM chips. These are made by Hitachi. They're 150 nanosecond RAM chips. Next to the ROM sockets, it has a socket labeled Scratch Pad SRAM. And this chip here is a 6116, 
which is a 2K static RAM chip. So this has 2K of scratch pad RAM. There are a lot of dip switches on the CPU board, including these, which are obviously for setting the amount of RAM. And then some more that I don't really understand the purpose of. But then there's one that says 8087, which is obviously for enabling the optional math core processor. And curiously, there's one that says 60 hertz. So I don't know if I flipped that, if we would change the video output to 50 hertz for PAL compatibility. And these say weight states, and it goes from 1 to 5. And it looks like it's set to 3 weight states, which seems pretty high. It also has an unused pinout for a reset button. This ribbon cable between the CPU board and the I.O. board is where you would install that optional card for adding the ISA slot, which unfortunately I don't have. You can also get an aftermarket daughter board for the Z148, which added two ISA slots and a real-time clock. You can even get an external expansion chassis, which was basically just a PC clone case with an expansion backplane in it instead of a motherboard. And then on the I.O. board, we can see the Motorola 6845, which is the display controller chip for the CGA graphics. And here is the 8250 UART chip for the serial port. And nearby it has 24416 chips for the video RAM. So it only has 16K video RAM. There are some solder jumpers for configuring it. This one here is video enable. So if you remove that, it would disable the onboard video. And then parallel enable, which likewise, if you remove that, it would disable the parallel port. There's also a font jumper. So if you solder the jumper on there, it would change the font to probably a thin font for the CGA instead of the standard thick font. And also COM 1 or 2, so probably if you remove this jumper, it would change the built-in serial port from COM 1 to COM 2. And finally COM enable, so if you remove that, it would disable the onboard serial port. It also has these jumpers relating to the horizontal and vertical sync of the video circuitry. And near the composite video output, there are two trimmers for contrast and what is probably black level. It also has a pinout for a light pen, but that's not connected to anything. Up near the front, you can see the turbo switch labeled 4.7 and 8 megahertz. And there you can see two crystals. One is 14.31818 megahertz, and the other one is 24 megahertz. The 14.31818 megahertz crystal is the main timing of the whole system. And the original IBM PC it was divided by three to get the CPU speed of 4.77 megahertz because they were too cheap to add another crystal to run the CPU at its full rated speed of 5 megahertz. And that 14.31818 megahertz crystal was also divided by four to get the NTSC color burst frequency of 3.58 megahertz. However, in this system, because it doesn't have a color composite video output, that's not actually used for anything. Now in other Turbo XT clones, that crystal was also commonly divided by two to get a CPU speed of 7.16 MHz, such as in my Tandy 1000 SX. Again, slightly underclocking a CPU that would be normally rated for 8 MHz. But since this Zenith has a 24 MHz crystal, they divided by three to run the CPU in turbo mode at its full rated speed of 8 MHz. I could upgrade the RAM, but first of all, I don't have these chips on hand. And the people selling these kind of vintage RAM chips are not selling them dirt cheap anymore. So it would be pretty expensive to upgrade this to the full 768K. And besides, since I don't have that board to add the ISA slot, this computer is never going to have a hard drive or anything fancy like that. It's always going to be a very basic floppy drive only system. So I'll just leave it 256K and that'll be part of the fun to see what can actually run in that amount of RAM. Because that's something a lot of people actually faced back in the day when they were using these computers. It was a luxury to have the full 640K. So a lot of people lived with only 256K and they were still able to get their work done and to play games. But I will replace the 8088 chip with a NEC V20 
which gives you a 15 to 20 percent speed boost and also lets you run real mode 286 applications and then I'll install this 8087 math core processor for doing my Lotus 123 spreadsheets. There you can see I installed the NIC V20 CPU and the 8087 math core processor and I also changed the dip switch to tell it that the 8087 is installed. I could also put in one of these Dallas smartwatch chips or a modern equivalent of it which I did a video about a couple years ago but again I want to keep this computer more original and closer to how it was actually used back in the day where you would need to type in the time and date every time you turned it on or else all your files would be dated January 1st 1980. So here's my first test of the repaired power supply. I don't have any disk drives connected yet. I just want to see if it works. See if we get an image on our TV which is connected to the composite video output. And yes we do. It just says disk error seek failure because it's looking for a floppy drive and there isn't any. But there's something neat you can do with these Zenith PCs without needing a boot disk. And the way you access that is you press Control alt insert instead of Control alt delete And there it says MFM140 monitor version 2.1, memory size 256K bytes. Enter question mark for help. And there it shows all the commands you can do. I won't go through all of them, but you can see it has diagnostics, you can display memory, you can do hex, math, all sorts of things. And you can even do color bars, except since we're using that monochrome composite output, we're not seeing any color, we're just getting grayscales. Now I also connected it to my Tandy RGB monitor so we can actually see it in color. But there's one thing I want to try is shorting out the pins of that reset button connector with my screwdriver to see if that resets the computer. Yep, looks like that definitely works. So if I soldered in a button and some wires to those pins, I would have a working reset button. Another thing I want to try is I just flipped that dip switch that was marked 60 hertz, and I'll reset it and it'll see if it gives us PAL video at 50 hertz. This is a multi-system TV, so this should display it, but this monitor should start rolling if it's putting out a 50 hertz signal. So I'll reset it again. If I can get my screwdriver on those pins. There we go. Yep, indeed. That monitor is rolling because it's now putting out a 50 hertz video signal. Another neat thing I can do if I switch into graphics mode is smooth scrolling. So here's the normal scrolling. You can see how jerky that is. Now if I do VS2, that should give me smooth scrolling. See, look at that. It's doing smooth scrolling. You can't do that in a standard PC with regular CGA. Only on a Zenith you can get smooth scrolling. And now if I type test, we can do the built-in diagnostics. It has a disk read test, a keyboard test, a memory test, and a power-up test. So I'll do the keyboard test, and all that does is fill the screen with whatever letter or number or symbol you type on the keyboard. So that way you can check that all the keys are working. If we do the memory test, it starts beeping and it, it's going to take quite a while, but it'll go through and it'll test the system and the video memory. Here are the two floppy drives. They were made by Matsushita, in other words, Panasonic. And you can replace these with three and a half inch floppy drives, but since the onboard controller does not support high density, those will only be usable as 720k double density drives. But speaking of the floppy drives, you'll notice there is no twist in the cable between the A and B drives, unlike the IBM PC and most other PC clones. Instead, Zenith followed the original Shugart floppy drive interface design, which uses the drive select jumpers to determine which drive is A and which drive is B. You can see this one is set to drive select 1, which indicates it's the A drive, while this one is set to drive select 2, which indicates it's the B drive. Most other manufacturers labeled the drive select jumpers 0 through 3 instead of 1 through 4, 
in which case the A drive would be drive select 0 and the B drive would be drive select 1. And this complicates things when you want to replace one of these drives with a 3.5 inch floppy drive because most of these are hardwired for drive select 1 and cannot be changed. And if you think you can just replace this cable of a standard one with the twist in it between the A and B drives, that won't work. You'll need to either find an old 3.5 inch drive which does have the drive select jumpers on it, or if you have one of these more modern drives, you'll just have to stick to using it as the B drive. Once you get it booted up into DOS, the Z148 suddenly becomes a lot less interesting. From this point forward, it's really just a plain Jane Turbo XT clone, a little bit faster than the IBM PC, but still with standard CGA graphics and PC speaker sound, no hard drive, and no slot to add a sound card or anything like that. And with only 256K of RAM, a lot of stuff simply won't run. Like if I try to run QBASIC, it just says program too big to fit in memory. But I can at least run the landmark speed test, flashing images warning. And it shows it has a NEC V20 CPU running at 8 MHz, Intel 887 floating point unit, CGA graphics, and it's performing like a 5 MHz AT, which is pretty good for an XD class machine. If I switch it down to regular speed, it becomes a lot slower. And it has excellent CGA compatibility. All the fancy tricks you can do with CGA work fine with this including the unofficial 160 by 116 color graphics mode, which is really just a manipulated text mode. These days, the keyboard that came with the Z148 is worth more than the rest of the computer, mostly due to its Green Alps linear mechanical key switches. Plus, it's neat how the lock lights are in the keys instead of separate. And it has an electronic key click beeper Maybe you can just about hear it beeping when I press a key. And that's not the PC speaker and the computer making that sound. There's a little beeper built into the keyboard itself. And the longer you hold down a key, the faster it repeats. But there are some strange layout choices, such as this extra wide bracket key and narrow enter key. So sometimes I find myself accidentally hitting that bracket key instead of enter. Oh f Because they're so valuable, if you come across one of these Z148s for sale, it's almost guaranteed not to come with the original keyboard. Thankfully, vintage Zenith PCs use standard XT or AT keyboards, so a regular keyboard will work with them. It's not a proprietary interface. The Z148 was replaced in 1987 with the Zenith Easy PC, which I did a video about several years ago. That machine was actually less expandable than the Z148 because it only came with a permanently attached monochrome monitor and you could not add any expansion slots to it. And the Easy PC was criticized in the press as costing more and doing less than its competitors. Nonetheless, it seems like more Easy PCs actually survive today because the Easy PC was aimed mostly at the consumer market, and the discount catalog Damark sold them at a bargain price. So, would I recommend getting a Zenith Z148 PC? Well, the question is almost irrelevant because you'll probably never find one. The one thing I like about it is that you'll never get the itch to go crazy upgrading it because besides the simple things I showed in this video, you can't upgrade it. And I think that's part of its charm. It's always going to be a low-end, plain-Jane, mid-1980s PC clone, just like the kind that millions of people used back then to do word processing, spreadsheets, and other mundane tasks. And judging by the function key template, that's what the original owner of this machine used it for. 